Hi, everybody. Just uh, want to say welcome to our June since software craftsmanship meetup. Um, we are very excited to have you here and uh, look forward to um, Izzy's talk. Uh, so I am really excited for this month's presentation because I think it is extremely important and also extremely timely. So um, without further ado, this is Izzy Biken presenting uh, Being a Better Ally. Take it away, Izzy. Thanks, Michael, for the great introduction. Um, I am really nervous and and scared and excited to, to be here and giving you this presentation today. Um, this is a talk I've been working on for several, several months, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to have the privilege to give it today at this software craftsmanship meetup. Um, this accidentally ended up being really great timing. Um, Michael reached out, Michael knew that I was working on this speech and reached out to me a couple months ago about presenting at Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship and it ended up happening, you know, a month or so ago that my talk got accepted for the June meetup and um, with the state of everything that's going on today, this is, this is really just great timing. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here today and being willing to learn about being a better ally because without allies, we're not going to live in a, in a world that, that accepts minorities. Um, and uh, because of everything that's going on in the world today, I'm going to be donating $5 for every person who's here attending this stream to Black Lives Matter at the end of the talk. Um, so if, if you want to help me up my donation and you want other people to, to come and view this talk to you, please feel free to just text your friends real quick that, that this talk is going on and that it's important. Um, so as I get started, I think the first thing that we need to do is, is really define what an ally is. And, um, and make sure we're all on the same page and make sure we all know what it really means to be an ally. By its basic definition, an ally is someone who supports disenfranchised and underrepresented groups of people. This sounds really simple and easy, but unfortunately being an ally isn't just this, right? Um, it's really easy to say, yes, I totally support you. You're doing a great job. But sometimes, you know, just those words are, are really just empty. And if you don't have actions that follow those words, are you really being an ally? But being an ally, really uh, what it means is it involves, being an ally involves a conscious and deliberate effort. Noticing how your actions affect others and understanding how your opportunities are not the same as those who are different from you. Sometimes, as an ally, you need to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and step outside of your box to advocate for those who are not the same as you, and, and sticking up for those who, who those, those in need. It is really weird giving this talk. Um, so, who needs an ally? There are a lot of people out there who need an ally. The main three groups that people think of when you say someone when you talk about allies are women, people of color, and LGBTQ. And I'm really sorry that my video is covering up LGBTQ. It's not intentional. I wrote this talk before I realized I was going to be giving it on Twitch, and this top corner ends up being the best space for most of my, my video most of the time. Um, so that's super not intentional. I also want to point out the fact that I spell women with an X. This X is not meant to be exclusive towards men. The X is there because spelling women with an X is more inclusive to non-binary and trans identities, which often get overlooked even in the even with the LGBTQ group. Um, but like I said, these three are not the only groups that need allies. Other groups that need allies include, but are not limited to, veterans, parents, people with disabilities, both physical and mental, both visible and non-visible various religious groups, felons, COVID high-risk individuals, and junior devs or new hires. Um, again, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the groups that need allies. So if you're aware of a group that's not on this list that needs an ally, please post it in the, the stream chat so everyone else can learn more about who needs allies. Additionally, I do want to point out while we're here 
that the only group that I'm really a part of that needs an ally is the women group. Um, I am super nervous about giving this talk because I really am nervous about doing justice to the rest of these groups that I don't fall into. But it's good that I'm nervous about this because it means that I care and it means that I am going to go out of my way and try to do a better job to make sure that I actually do, do have them represented well in this talk. So why, why is it important that all of these people need allies? Allies change lives, right? Without allies, I wouldn't be where I am today. Tech is really notorious for the lack of diversity that just exists in our world. And so many people have quit tech because of how terribly they have been treated by, by members of the tech community. And that, that's not okay. That's not, not something we should feel comfortable with. And a lot of people think that the way to fix this problem is to just hire more diverse candidates from more diverse backgrounds, more minorities, more, more whatever, insert your diversity statistic here. But that doesn't really fit the problem if people are still leaving tech because of how they're being treated. What we really want to do instead is, is fix the problem in the workplace. We want to, to train our current employees to be better allies so that when we do go out and hire these, these diverse candidates, they're having a more they're having a better experience in their work lives and they're willing to stay and and want to be a part of our community. What we want to do is be allies to affect the lives and livelihoods of those around us. Like I said, allies change lives. And my career is always, always better when I'm working with or for people who are, who are allies. The situations and jobs that I've been in where I am not with allies, my career has absolutely suffered. And I, I can still feel the ramifications from the job that I had, you know, when I first left college. Being an ally is about caring about others and helping to amplify and improve lives. And that's something we should all care about. Unfortunately, everyone is not an ally. If everyone was an ally, that would be fantastic. I wouldn't be here giving this talk today. You know, I, there wouldn't be riots across the entire country about police brutality and the world would just in general be a, a better place. Unfortunately, there's a lot of different reasons why, why various individuals aren't allies. For starters, leadership groups often are just, they're whitewashed. They're very not diverse. Um, and minorities who want to join these leadership groups see these few seats at the table that are, you know, actually being held by minorities and think that those are the only, the only seats for them. So we often end up competing with other minorities and trying to put them down. This needs to change, right? Instead of trying to put down other minorities, what we need to do is we need to work together to hold leadership accountable and hold those white men who are in charge accountable and ask them why they're not hiring more minorities, why their boards aren't more diverse, and, and, and what can we do to get these boards to be more diverse? What, what needs to happen? Other reasons that people often aren't allies is just a lack of education or misinformation. Oftentimes people just know, don't know better. They don't understand their actions and how their actions are actually affecting the lives of those around them. Someone maybe gave them bad advice, or maybe they're not willing to think outside of their experiences to understand where other people are coming from. Um, feedback is a gift, right? And a lot of people who aren't willing to be allies don't view feedback as a gift, especially when their actions are being corrected. These bad behaviors that people are experiencing need to go away. And in my talk, I give a lot of examples of bad behaviors that, and, and ways to improve upon them. All of the bad behaviors that I show off in my talk um, have actually happened. They're things that have happened to either myself or someone that I know. And if you see yourself in one of these, these situations, these bad situations, right, don't take this as a personal attack. It's not. This is just an opportunity for education, for you to learn from your mistakes and just improve them forward. So how do you, how do people become allies, right? Like, you know, you want to be an ally, you understand that allies are important, but what's next? Well, okay, you're here. So like, that's number one, right? You want to be an ally. That's so important. Yay, good job. 
being an ally is a journey, right? No one is going to wake up tomorrow or leave this talk and magically just be a perfect ally. It is really difficult to be a perfect ally. It's a 24-7 job. And I would almost argue that there's no such thing as a perfect ally. And if there is, I really want to meet this person. Um, they're just... There just happens to be people who are further along with their journeys than others. And good job being here and, you know, taking steps for your journey to be a better ally. The other thing allies really need to do is just strive to improve every day. This is the best thing you can do. Learn from mistakes that you make. Forgive yourselves for some mistakes that you're making. You listen to the advice that I'm about to give and take it apart. Implement it. You might not implement it all at once, but if you implement it even just a little bit at a time, you're doing a great job. Trying right now is more important than not trying. And the best you can do is strive every day to be a better ally than you were the day before. To help you with that, I'm about to give you a, a lot, a lot of advice um, on how to be a better ally. And we're going to start by talking about inclusive language. And inclusive language is huge. There's a lot of times where I'm in meetings or rooms or situations where um, I just feel excluded because of, you know, a variety of different things and what people are saying. And it's not really a fun experience, and it's not really somewhere I really like to be. The first, the first place where inclusive language really is important is in the terms that we use, right? Um, the words you use have an impact and can really make people feel wanted. And a lot of times people don't really realize that the words they're using are, are exclusive and really harming individuals around them or, or not representing individuals around them very well. So again, this is just a small list of exclusive terms and better terms to use instead. The one that really, really bothers me is the one at the top, guys. Guys is not a gender neutral term. It does not describe a mixed gender group of people. It describes a group of men. And it's really frustrating for me when I am part of a group that is referred to as guys, especially in the role where, that I have now, where I am the only female developer on my team. So when someone comes up to my team and says, hey, good job, guys, I definitely feel like they're talking to the rest of my team and not me. It's not that hard to adapt to the word y'all or folks or team or people. It's so, in my mind, that's a very simple thing to do and it makes a lot more people feel a lot more included in the discussions. Using terms like parent over mother and father, again, we're taking gender out of the equation. Whitelist and blacklist, replacing those with accepted and prohibitive, where whitelist and blacklist weren't really created with racial intentions, but I mean, do we really need to say that something black is prohibited? Uh, if we can, just using those accepted and prohibited, right, you know, takes takes that out of the equation. He or she is not a term that, uh, er, he or she is a term that erases identities of trans and non-binary people. Instead of he or she, using terms such as they or people of all genders instead really does a good job of including more LGBTQ and something I've really been trying to do lately is removing crazy or insane from my vocabulary and replacing it with terms such as interesting and real or outrageous. So like I said, this is not an inclusive list. One of the terms that I'm kind of upset that I left off of this list is, is husband and wife, right? Again, this is a really gendered term. If we replace husband and wife with spouse, partner, or significant other, we're doing a great, we're, we're making strides to make the LGBTQ community feel a lot more included and feel make them feel safer about talking about their partners. Um, if any of you out there can think of other terms that, that are exclusive and, and more inclusive terms that we can use instead, please post them in the chat so, so more people can learn as well. In um, addition to using more inclusive terms, names. Names is huge, right? There are a number of ways that names are used in a non-inclusive manner. And we're going to start, and so I have several examples, but we're going to start with this one. This is an example of a text chat that someone has started with Malika Ryan. Malika Ryan is a fictional person, but they have a really nice name here because one of their names 
their last name is very male and very white, and one of their names is not, right? It's really common for names, especially if you're using some sort of like Microsoft Office suite, names to be listed as last name comma first name. It's something that's understood 98% of the time, except for the times where you end up with a name like this, where you have a very male, white last name and a very non-male, non-white first name. At this point, people get stuck on the name that's more familiar to them. And even after being corrected that like, this person is in this chat, they still think, oh, this name, this is my familiar, this name is the one that's familiar to me, so this is the name that I'm going to use because it's all about me, right? Not this Malika tool. What we're doing here is erasing part of Malika's identity. Also, when someone actually does end up correcting this green employee here, and they do actually end up listening to, to this correction finally, Right? A lot of times what you hear people say is, oh my gosh, did you know that Malika Ryan is a girl? Which is problematic for so many different reasons. Um, women are referred to as girls a lot longer than they're referred to as boys, than, than men are referred to as boys, right? So, like, when you, if you're not comfortable referring to a male of the same age as a boy, you should not be using the term girl to describe a woman in the office. It also believes that you don't, it also comes off as, like, that you don't believe these women candidates can do these jobs that they're hired for, right? It's so surprising to you that this person was a woman that you feel the need to repeat it in the office, like, frequently? It, it really doesn't come off very well. Um, also, Malika Ryan is a fictional person, but Ryan is my spouse's last name. And situations like this is a large part of the reason that I didn't change my name when I got married. I didn't want to have to constantly correct people or surprise them that I was female. It wasn't, it's not what I'm here for. Um, other ways names can be exclusive are situations like this. So here's someone whose name is Michael. They like going by the name Michael, right? And they're introducing themselves to someone with the name Michael who decides that it's totally fine to call them Mike. Again, you're erasing Michael's identity here. And this is something I identify a lot with. Um, Izzy is unfortunately not my full first name. I talked to my mother about it. She still thinks Elizabeth is a great name. It's fine. Um, and I'm really fortunate right now that I work for a company that allows me to have my preferred name in my email address. But even with Izzy as my name and my email address, I still have people emailing me spelling my name wrong. Or when I work at companies that don't allow this, I still have people calling me Elizabeth, Liz, Beth, Lizzie, all sorts of different names that just aren't my name. And if people aren't going to take the care enough to get my name right, how are they going to listen to me professionally? It's the root of this matter here isn't necessarily that I'm being called a name. It's that people aren't listening to things that I'm saying and aren't willing to to work with me on something as simple and personal as my name. A positive example of how to be really inclusive when, with names is, is this example. We have this character over here who has changed their name from Melissa to Sam and is starting to use they, theirs pronouns. Fantastic. This response that's happening is, is great, right? Sam says, hey, my name is Sam. I'm using they, theirs pronouns. And the person they're talking to is saying, this is great. Love it. You know, is there anything you need help with, right? This is such a positive example of, of how to really be inclusive with someone's name. And a lot of times when, when people change their names and come out as they, theirs pronouns, you hear, you see a lot of cisgender people saying, you know, It'll take me a minute to get used to this, right? I totally support you, it's great, but like, please be patient with me while I get used to this. And I, I have a small problem with that because this is giving, for, for people who say that, it's giving you an excuse to devalue someone's identity. And that's not really how I behave. The, the final one and the biggest one that has to deal with inclusive language is corporate policies. Yeah. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to give this talk because I love giving my rant about how much I hate dress codes. 
almost all dress codes are sexist or racist or some combination of the above. Okay. This dress code, for example, um, makes women be held accountable for men's reactions to their bodies. Sure, the, the bullet points of, you know, shirts that cover your midriff are accessible, not wearing ladies' pants, not wearing revealing clothes, and not, wearing, not having visible underwear all hold women accountable for how men would react to what they're wearing instead of holding men accountable for their reactions to what women are wearing. Points for athletic shoes and hiking boots being not acceptable isn't very inclusive for folks with disabilities, right? I have a lot of orthopedic issues. If I had to wear dress shoes every single day, all day, my feet would be killing me. It's so much more comfortable for me to wear something with arch support. Um, Non-religious head coverings, kind of, like, it seems okay. Like, you're allowing those religious head coverings, so, like, you're doing at least something. But what about someone with cancer? What about someone with chemotherapy who's who's losing their hair and would feel a lot more comfortable if they could wear a scarf over their head. Uh, slacks? Sounds great, right? Um, dockers only make pants for men. I have these things called hips, and dockers don't, don't really fit on them. Having dresses and skirts be, you know, only allowable by women? Again, we're erasing non-binary and trans identities. And shorts in the office. I know, I know men really like the ability to wear shorts in the office, and they say it's very similar to wearing dresses and skirts in the office. But here's the thing. Women's shorts cover me mid-thigh at best. Men's shorts go down to their knees. Skirts, while, I, while it's a lot easier for me to find dresses and skirts that go down to my knees, every single time I've worn a dress or a skirt to the office, Someone goes, oh, Izzy, you look nice today. What, you got a hot date or something? Are you doing an interview? Why aren't you wearing pants? Which is not, none of those are appropriate conversations in the workplace or appropriate things to say to me. And make me want to, they don't make me feel comfortable wearing dresses and skirts in the office. So shorts and skirts aren't interchangeable. And appropriate hairstyles. A lot of companies have gotten black in the media for having a list of appropriate hairstyles, which is really harmful for black people, right? Black hair is different than white hair. Just because a white person can do something with their hair doesn't mean a black person can do that. Their hair is different. It lays differently and functions differently than white hair. And having a list of appropriate hairstyles is really harmful for the for black individuals. Dress codes can be summed up in two words. Dress appropriate. This is General Motors dress code. They took their 10 page dress code and changed it down to these two words. And I think it is fantastic. This link to this blog here at the bottom has a lot of more research and a lot more language related to um, more inclusive dress codes. And I, I would love it if all of you check out this link and um, see if you can do something to change their dress codes in your office. Other policies that are often very exclusive and could do a much better job of being inclusive is your healthcare. Right? Most companies don't have healthcare coverage for trans individuals. Or if they do, it's crap. Um, everyone's aware that in the United States, our maternity and paternity system, these systems are trash. But also, beyond that, what about alternative methods of pregnancy? Right? What about surrogates and IVF and adoption and um, any sort of fertility treatment? Does your healthcare, do your healthcare options cover any of those? Because not being able to get pregnant in a traditional manner is a common problem for a lot of couples. And finally, therapy, right? With all of the changes that are happening in the world, therapy is going, mental health is, needs to be more important than it ever has been in the past. I mean, if your company has crap, therapy policies and mental health policies, you're not doing your employees a service. And you're not including everyone. Inclusive language changes over time. Right? And you should and as someone who needs who's trying to be an ally, you need to, to accept the feedback when inclusive language changes. And you can't be upset when someone changes language someone correct your numbers, you didn't realize this change, right? 
This is part of continuing education. We're all in tech. One of the responsibilities of being in tech is continuous learning, right? And increase and allied behaviors and inclusive language need to be part of that inclusive learning. Um, when I first started dating my spouse, like five or six years ago now, I caught him using the word queer to me weird a couple of different times. And the third time I heard this, I sat him down and I was like, hey, you know, but like, you can't use this word to me this anymore. Like, it's, it's not okay. And one of his arguments in, <laughs> in defense of, of what he was saying was, well, you know, I grew up this way. And I'm like, buddy, like, we're basically the same age I grew up. I definitely, like, in, in my past, I've, I've used this word this way too, but I learned that it was bad and I stopped using it. I've never heard my spouse say queer since, and I am very thankful he we had that conversation and he took it as well as he did. It made it was one of the things that made me think that, you know, this guy is definitely on his journey to be an ally as well. Representation matters, right? Lack of representation is what's gotten us to where we are today. Because when people aren't being represented, their voices aren't being heard, people aren't understanding their problems. And, and the world just ends up going to shit. And a lot of people think that if this, is, this is a fine sentiment, right? A lot of people think that this is cool, right? Saying, I want to hire people who look and think like us. They think that having this similar group of people, you're going to you know, reach the system faster, you're going to get to prod faster, your products will, will go out and be successful because you were able to come to these decisions quickly. Um, yeah, but you also don't have a diverse mindset pointing out holes in, in places, right, where, where you didn't think of, of this scenario or this situation. Think that, look at, like, Target, for example. How much trouble did Target get in for not having, um, ADA compliance on the website? Was anyone on that project, like, disabled? Did anybody on that project think of disability at all? I, I hope not, because if someone did and, and they still got in all that trouble, then, you know, you really should have listened to that person, but, you know, it's neither here nor there. Really, instead of this homogenous group of people, what you want is this diverse group. You want to hire from a variety of diverse backgrounds and demographics to create a better product. Um, I don't have examples necessarily for the tech industry, but there have been studies in the dis judicial world where that have been comparing um, homogenous and non-homogenous juries. And these non-homogenous juries have reached consensus faster. Right? So I feel like those studies are still pretty valid for tech. If you have a non-homogenous group of people, you're going to be more willing to hear different ideas. You'll reach more willing to learn. You'll reach consensus faster, and you're going to build a better product because you're thinking of more individuals as you create it. But representation doesn't just stop in the conference rooms, right? What does your so what do your social media feeds look like? Do you have social media feeds that are full of people who look and think like you? What does your entertainment look like? Are you always watching um, TV or shows or movies or reading books that have been written by people who look like you and and the main characters are people who look like you? Or do you have diversity? Do you reach out and find? Um, content that's created by people who don't look like you. Um, I know BuzzFeed is doing a really good job right now of trying to highlight black creators. So I, I'd like to challenge everybody to, to, to go to BuzzFeed and find one of the lists of content that is being created by entertainment content that's been created by black creators and read something, watch something, um, listen to something that's on that list. Equity, right. Equity is one of the most important topics for being an ally. And it is super difficult to understand. So the difference between equity and equality is often really a new concept for, for people. So I'm going to explain this in the terms of a pizza night at a family's household. So equality is where everyone gets the same, right? Regardless of what we're trying to get, everybody gets the same. So in a pizza night example, right, we have this family, they've ordered pizza, they are going on vacation tomorrow, and don't want any leftover pizza. This is the only reason I could come up with as to why you wouldn't want leftover pizza. To be fair, they've decided that everyone is going to get the same percentage of pizza. Everyone's going to get two slices. 
the person on the far right, oh gosh, I can't do my right now. The far right, my, it's my right, I don't know. Um, <laughs> has, has two slices of pizza. They are comfortably full. They're feeling pretty great. And the, the person in the middle, who probably a kid, has the smallest appetite of the group, is way too full. And the person on the left, who is probably the biggest person in the group, is still hungry after the two slices of pizza. So with this equal system, only one person is happy. And two people either have too much or too little. So what if we switched this pizza example over to equity, where everybody gets what they need to, to meet the end result. And the end result in this case is being full. All right. So if we go back to our pizza, right? The person who is comfortable with two slices of pizza still gets the two slices of pizza. The person who is way too full gets a little bit of a cutback. It's one slice of pizza, is comfortably full. Everybody, so far, everybody's happy. And then the person in the end, the biggest person, the one with the biggest appetite, gets the full three slices of pizza that they need to be full. Yes. Um, and, and everyone ends up happy when everyone gets a little bit different pieces of the pie to, to, to get to the point where everyone is full, right? Um, so equity isn't just about percentages and pieces of the pie. There's lots of different circumstances that employees have where they need a little bit of equity, a little bit of extra help and assistance. And if you're not willing to provide equity for these employees for some of these little things, what does it look like when we get to the bigger things, such as, you know, compensation. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple of different examples of, of why an employee would need equity. So we've got a bunch of circumstances on, on this chart here, right? We've got two employees who are parents. Parents are, are stuck at home with their kids all day. Um, and, and especially in, in the situation where everyone's working from home, everyone's doing school from home. So for parents, you, you have to account for the fact that they are also in addition to doing all of their work responsibilities, they're trying to take care of someone else, an entire extra person during the day or extra several people during the day. And sometimes they need the ability to leave meetings. Having, uh, or maybe, you know, you have a rule where you don't schedule something over lunch because all of these parents need to feed their kids. And having them attend meetings out, outside of the work hours when, when their kids really are used to getting attention or need dinner or something along those lines, again, it's not... Not super cool um, for people who don't own a car. Like maybe their their work is a little bit better right now because no one's going anywhere. But back back when we were able to go places, or or when we are able to go places again, think about you know it's not very feasible for for these employees to have a very flexible schedule because they're reliant on public transportation. They can't really go to places outside of the office like. If you are planning an event outside of the office, do buses on there. Um, something that you can do for these employees is if you're doing something outside of work hours or um, off-site, you know, be willing to expense ride share or lifts for them. Um, for parents, if you're doing something outside of the office you, or inside the office after hours, you know, set up a conference room with, you know, a movie and the pizza that you are already ordering anyhow to allow these parents to still watch their kids, but be involved with whatever is happening. Employees with health issues also need equity, right? Um, maybe they need the, the ability to flex their schedules so they can go to the doctor's appointments that they need to go to. Maybe they, they are, whatever their health issues are, they're able to do the eight hours a day of work, but they can't do much more than that. And they can't really do work outside of work. For people who are involved in outside organizations, Right. This is this is me. This is where I really need equity. In this in this example, right? Um, I have I'm involved in a lot outside of the office, and I pull a lot of weeks where I work 12 to 14 days a week, but from my eight hours a day at work to my on top of that work that I'm doing for outside organizations. It's really important to me to have breaks and, and make sure that I have a lunch or, or an hour after work to, to relax and take care of my mental health. If you're asking me to do stuff outside of the office, you know, I often just don't have time to do that. And, you know, I, I need assistance in those places. I need stuff to be recorded. And I'm really happy that this talk is being recorded tonight for all of these people who, who 
aren't able to be here for one circumstance or another, but they still have the chance to view this. That's providing equity. One of the easiest ways you can realize when someone needs equity or not is to recognize privilege. Recognizing privilege is is huge. This is one of the biggest things that you can do as an ally. Because once you recognize what privileges you have, you can start understanding why people aren't acting the way that you are because they don't necessarily have the ability to because they don't have the privileges that you have. Um, so it's so kind of hard. And, and privileges, too, is more than just, you know, race, gender, and sexual orientation. There's a lot that goes into privilege. So to demonstrate that, we have this example here of this employee who is really confused. Um, he doesn't understand or why their coworkers bring their lunch every day because they think it's really fun to, to go out to lunch every single day. There's actually a lot of privilege involved in this kind of just simple scenario. For starters, this person can afford to go out to lunch every single day. They are not in debt. They're not living paycheck to paycheck. They have these oodles of cash, you know, at their dispense or at their disposal so that um, they, they can, you know, enjoy going out wherever they want every single day. They have a clean bill of health without allergies, illnesses, or diseases. They're not vegan or vegetarian. You can see that because they have a burger, right? There's very few food limitations for this person, so they can go Again, basically wherever they want. Um, they don't struggle getting around, so they're most likely able-bodied. If they work in a suburban environment, they have a car. They are able to take longer lunches because maybe they're able to stay at work a little bit longer than some of the other, some of their colleagues. And whatever race and gender they are is most likely the majority for the area that they live in. I, I bet you didn't think that I was going to be explaining that, like that level of privilege went into this simple explanation. But there's actually a lot of privileges that go into the workplace. So this is a list from a company called Better Allies. So I'm going to talk a little bit more later in this talk. Um, and it's 50 privileges that you have in the workplace that, that people could have in the workplace. Um, Better Allies does a really good job of creating their content. They're very, very thoughtful when they do. So um, unfortunately, I don't have time to read this list in its entirety right now. But, you know, I will be posting links to my slides and there will be a link to this so you can go through and, and figure out what privileges you do experience later. And again, this is this is not an exhaustive list. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, too. There, there's stuff on this list that isn't there. When I first went through this list, I had, I think, 22 or 23 different privileges. And at first... I thought I was lucky. I have almost half of those privileges that are listed here. And then I thought about that statement and I realized it was absurd. And instead of being, instead of feeling lucky that I have half of these privileges, I should feel really angry that I work with people who have, you know, twice the advantages that I do. And really, like, how has this affected my career? And if I'm angry that I only have 22 or 23 of these privileges, then what What do people who have less privilege than me, like, how, like I couldn't, like, I was, I was so angry when I got to the end of this thought train that it's still, like, uh, it still, it bothers me. All right. So with your privilege, once you figure out what privileges that you have, the most important thing that you can do once you recognize your privilege, is to use your privilege to amplify the voices of those who do not experience your privilege and work with them in a way that solves problems that works for them. All right? You're amplifying voices. You're working with others to do something that works for them. Just because something works for you with your privileges that you have does not mean that exact scenario is going to play out the same way with someone who does not have your privileges. Not everything works the same for everyone. And again, that's one of the reasons that that we're in the situation we are in today in America. Because white people think that what works for white people is going to work for black people. And that's not the case. Right? Working with people also involves listening to them and understanding what they're trying to tell you instead of assuming what they want to tell you. So, again, we have a couple of examples that kind of go over this, because this manifests itself in a couple of different ways. 
So first scenario, here we have a woman coming to a male colleague asking for an opinion about this idea that they have. And the man hears the idea and goes, oh my gosh, it's great. I'm going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to be a champion for this for you. Let me go tell management. And the girl is kind of sitting here like, whoa, like this wasn't what I wanted. This is my idea. Like why, why should you walk and tell management? Because here's what's going to happen. And this male colleague goes and tells management. No matter how many times he credits the woman with the idea, he's still going to be the one who gets credit for it because the management has heard this idea come out of this person's mouth. And what they're remembering is the voice that told it to them, not who actually created the idea. What the male colleague should have done instead is ask the, the woman how she wanted to proceed. She is probably willing to take the idea to management herself. Maybe she just wanted someone to come with her while she talked to them, because sometimes it's easier to have a conversation with the other buddy. Maybe she just wanted feedback to see if there was no, like, obvious holes in her idea before, you know, taking it on to somebody who, whose opinion, you know, could really make or break the idea, right? Instead of, if, if you had conversations in this manner, right, we're doing something that works in a way that works for this woman instead of something that just worked for this man. And this woman is more likely to get credit for her work. The other situation that often happens um, is this is kind of a mansplaining situation, right? This, the white guy has learned this new topic and is super excited about it, goes up to his Asian coworker and goes, oh my gosh, I just learned this thing. It's great. Let me explain it to you. I'm going to tell you everything about it. And doesn't let the Asian coworker get a word in edgewise. When they're done with the explanation, the Asian coworker is like, yep, totally knew about this. Uh, you just quoted several of my articles that I've written. Definitely, I'm, I'm an expert. And, and the white colleague is still is like, you know what? I spent like, you know, 20, 30 minutes researching this. And I, I still think I know more than you. This happens a lot. This also happens with people's titles, right? Um, women who have PhDs often, or, or MDs even, often get mails to their husband where their husband is the doctor and not them. These people's are the fix. Um, a better way to approach conversations like this where you have a topic that you want to teach someone is to just approach it like a conversation. Hey, you know what? I just learned about this topic. I think it's super interesting. Let someone, and then, you know, letting their, whoever you're talking to have a chance to respond to let you, to let you know if they know or something about not. And then treat whatever their knowledge, whatever knowledge they have with respect. Value their opinions on something. This is so much more inclusive and understanding and welcoming than the previous conversation. And a lot of times, like, so, mansplaining to you, this ends up with impact over intent, right? The intent of, of when someone mansplains something is that, hey, you know, I have this really cool thing, and I really want to share it with everybody, and my intent is just to let everybody know about it. But the impact there ends up being, um, like, just super insulting to the people who know about it, right? We're just hearing stuff that we've already known, and it, it seems like people aren't valuing our intelligence. And impact over intent also ends up going back to like a lack of education, lack of understanding what really is happening, right? Because a lot of times, you know, people do things with the best intentions, but you can have the best intentions and still murder a million puppies. And if you're not caring about the fact that you're about to murder a million puppies because you have really good intentions, then you're not really viewing what you're doing in a 360 kind of way and understanding what really is going to go on around you after you complete this action. So the first example I have for impact over intent is a situation where you're in a group meeting and someone tells an inappropriate comment. This could be whatever inappropriate comment that you want it to be. It could be racist, it could be sexist, it could be homophobic, it could be bigotry, right? We've all heard inappropriate comments somewhere, just insert your favorite here. And the whole room, or most of the room, gets super offended. And this person tries to play it off, like, oh, hey, you know what, that was just a joke, you know, like, no, my, my intent was just to throw a joke, tell a joke, so... I, I haven't done anything wrong here. I'm just telling a joke, right? That's your intention, telling a joke. Your impact is you're making a lot of people feel very uncomfortable and feel very unwelcome and unappreciated in this environment. And most people don't want to stick around in environments where they feel unwelcome or unappreciated. There really isn't a positive scenario related to this. The positive scenario or what really should have happened instead is the person who tried to make the joke should have just kept their mouth shut, right? It's not the place, it's not the time. It's not what you want to do. 
Um, another place uh, where this comes in is you, you'll have someone get removed from a project because they seem stressed, right? The intent here is you want to remove someone, something that you think is stressing someone out. You want to take something off their plate so that, that they have a little bit more room to relax, right? But the impact is, is you're basically firing or demoting this employee. You're taking away something, and it could have been something that they really enjoyed working on. And, and that's, that's not fun to be on, on the, the impact side of this, right? No one really enjoys being fired or demoted, right? It's not, it doesn't leave warm, fuzzy feelings. But what you want to do instead is, is, is work with what the intent was. Your intent is to remove stress. So let's talk to the person and figure out how you can remove stress from them. See what, see what they have going on. Right? Maybe what you thought was stressing them out really isn't the thing that was stressing them out, and it's something else. And you know, once you figure, once you get to the root of the problem, you can you can work together to find a solution. Right? And working together is is a great ally action. Um, the, a final way that this comes into play is is when you're trying to get diverse opinions. Right? The intent of this conversation is to get and opinions from a diverse group of people. Uh, but instead of what you're doing is, is actually kind of really insulting. Um, this, this man is asking this, this black person, right, hey, like, I want your opinions. I want to know what all people of color will think. Okay, well, this, this black person can't give you the opinion of every single person of color, right? Black is not the only group that is included in people of color. Um, even if you were asking them what black people thought, you're still basically doing the same thing with being really insulting. Um, as, as someone from a minority group, when I get asked my opinion as a woman, um, I can't I can't speak for all women, right? All I can, the best I can do is give you my opinion based off of of my experiences and my experience as a woman. We'll call it my opinion, but. I can't speak on behalf of all women because I am not all women, right? Think of it this way. Like, if, if take whatever majority of your group you're a part of, and I'm going to pick on white men because more people need to pick on white men. But if someone came up to you and said, hey, can I get your opinion on this? I need to know what all white men think. Would you feel comfortable giving the opinion of all white men? Um, if you are looking for a diverse group of people to give an opinion, First step is to actually get a diverse group of people and not just ask one person. And then the second step is to literally just ask for their opinion, right? Because when you ask for the opinion of the group of people, you're telling, you're basically saying to the individual, like, hey, I don't care about your specific opinion. I want the group's opinion, which an individual can't really give an opinion for their group. But when you're framing it this this opinion this way, you're asking for their specific opinion and they're going to feel more valued and people really enjoy feeling valued. Uh, transparency is super healthy. Transparency is another great ally action because without transparency, people get left out of conversation, conversations and their voice gets marginalized, their opinions don't get heard. And again, we're creating unwelcome environments or we're deciding, we're deciding things on behalf of other people who weren't able to bring their voices to the table. <laughs> this happens a lot in the workplace, right? This is, let's say someone from management, right, is asking their employee why they haven't seen anything from them about some specific task. But the employee doesn't know anything about it because they haven't been told. Turns out management really only told one person on the team, and that person didn't disseminate the information to the rest of the team. And it's really hard to tell why, why this woman doesn't didn't hear from Tom, right? Did Tom not tell her on purpose because she's a woman? Did Tom just forget her? Um, both situations are pretty, pretty bad. If she doesn't know, then who else didn't Tom tell? Like, this isn't this isn't a good scenario. And the management is still blaming the woman for the fact that they didn't know something, that they had no idea they were supposed to know. This is also something that happens frequently um, where two different employees are talking to the same employee about the same thing um, and this is just really frustrating. Uh, it, it's a waste of pretty much everybody's in these conversations time, right? The purple employee is hearing the, the, um, the information multiple times. Who knows how many people Bob and Jim have to go talk to, to, to let them know about this topic that they think everyone should know. 
Um, and like, how do we even know that Bob and Jim are really saying the same information? Right. We all should have some sort of chat client where you can post messages and get replies. Um, and always assume, too, that if there's something that one person needs to know, chances are everyone needs to know it. If we have these public, these more public conversations, we're getting more people, more information faster, right? People are able to ask follow-up questions. If someone forgets some information, someone else can chime in and, and, and fill in the gap. Uh, this helps remove a blame culture, creating a less judgmental work environment, allowing for more vulnerability, and teaches people that it's okay for them to make mistakes and ask questions. Um, it means they're human, because everyone makes mistakes and asks questions, right? You can't expect your employees to be perfect robots who are perfect all of the time, right? You have to be able to forgive mistakes. Um, I was at a talk once, uh, a couple years ago now, at uh, UberConf, and uh, Jesse Kerr was talking about yak shaving, which um, I'm not super good at describing yak shaving. The best, the easiest way I can describe it is um, trying to find, like, small, simple problems that are easily removed, and that's not really doing the action justice, but that's not the whole point of my story. The point of my story is that uh, Jesse worked remotely, and what she did to help her out and help her coworkers out was she created her own Slack channel, it was a public Slack channel, that she went in and posted throughout her working day what she was working on and what she was doing and, and what she was getting stuck on. I always thought that was a really cool thing because everyone knew what Jesse was doing. When Jesse needed help and got stuck, right, there was this trail of what she'd been doing for her coworkers to go look at. It was a lot easier for her to get help. Um, it allowed her to be really vulnerable and and let um, and let and um, for like case of junior developers or someone who might not have been at Jesse's level, right, that's it's a really good learning opportunity for them to see her thought process and how she solved problems. I've always wanted to try it, but I've always been also really lazy and haven't really had a place where I, I could try it, um, but maybe one day. Finally, as an ally, one of the most important things you can do is have an open mind. Right? If you go into situations with the mindset that everyone is welcome here, you can change the world. Everyone is welcome here is a uh, saying that I, I borrowed from uh, an Ultimate Frisbee clothing company called BC Ultimate. And um, this is part of the company's creed, and I really like their creed, so I'm going to read it in full. So, everyone is welcome here, as long as you respect everyone else. We believe that each person is equal, and equitable action is required to reach equality. We believe there's beauty and diversity, spirit of the game, and that love is love. Um, this is a really great ally statement, um, and really comes across as, as loving, um, willing to, to believe that everyone is the same and that everyone is welcome here. Um, inclusion is for everyone. It's not just for minorities. Uh, practicing inclusion, behave, but it, it's not just for minorities, but it does help out minorities the most. Practicing inclusive behaviors helps you see the difference in everyone, and it's our differences that make us great. This is a lot, right? This has been a lot. Um, I really hope that you all have learned something. But again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. These are just the, the first eight ally actions that came to my mind, and I know that I'm missing some. Um, for example, this is the first time I've ever given a talk where I don't spend at least two minutes talking about how much I hate when people interrupt each other. Because interrupting, just make, when you interrupt someone, you make them think that you don't care about what they have to say. Whew. Yeah. Okay, good. I got my, I got my interruptions going. Um, and, and to be, this is a great step for being a better ally, but this is not, not the end of your education. This is, again, just the tip of your iceberg. You are still on your journey. Some of you may be at the start of your journey. Some of you may be in the middle of your journey. Some of you may, may have been pretty far in your journey, but hopefully you all learned something and are willing to keep your education continuing. Again, like... We need to strive to improve every day. Mistakes are fine. It's fine to make mistakes as long as we learn from them. When you make mistakes, understand what you did. Understand why what you did was harmful. Figure out how to do what you've done in a more inclusive and way that, that's more ac actionable as an ally. Forgive yourself and apologize to others if you need to. Um, this is... this. 
slide is a list of a lot of other companies and resources and Twitter follows and books and um, shows that that are good allies, but great for allies. Uh, Better Allies is the single best resource that I have ever come across about how to be a better ally. They came up with the 50 um, workplace privileges that we talked about earlier. They uh, release uh, five tips every week of how to be a better ally. Um, and, and they're really thoughtful with their posts and the things that they write. Um, one of the other favorite things that I like about them is they, they absolutely believe that inclusive language changes all the time and frequently see them retweet tweets that they made you know several years ago and update them with more inclusive language. Um, so I encourage you all to have uh, The Daily Show too is a really good job. Trevor Noah is in a really interesting uh, position where he is a an immigrant to the United States and he's black and he does a really good job of calling out white people on their bullshit and I really appreciate it. But I, I really do encourage all of you to at least check out some of these resources, if not all of them. Um, and before we leave, I, I want to touch back on um, the fact that the most important thing that we can do as an ally is to amplify the voices of those who don't, do not experience our privileges and work with them in ways that solve problems that works for them. Um, I have a fantastic privilege here today, and I would be irresponsible if I didn't use this privilege to talk about what's going on in, in America. Um, black people need allies now more than ever. And the Black Lives Matter movement is so important right now. And it is Black Lives Matter. It's not All Lives Matter. It's not Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. It is Black Lives Matter. This is where equity comes into play. Um, black people have been oppressed since literally the founding of our country. And it is time for them to stop being oppressed and stop being marginalized and time for us to start paying attention to them. Like I said in the beginning of the talk, I'm going to be donating to the Black Lives Matter movement $5 for every person who's here today. Um, I encourage you all to do the same. If if you aren't comfortable donating yourself or would just like me to lump some sort of donation for you and in with my in with my donation, feel free to Venmo me. My Venmo's in the bottom. And I will be matching any money that people Venmo me as well. Um, I do want to say again, too, that BuzzFeed is actually doing a really decent job covering this movement. Um, they are calling out celebrities when they're being tone deaf, which is important. They are posting articles to help people understand what is going on, which is really important. They are talking about their privilege, which is, again, important. And they're creating lists that highlight black creators and promoting black people, which is really, really important. Um, not everything works the same way for everyone, right? These protests in this movement against police brutality started off peacefully. They started off with Colin Kaepernick kneeling at the national anthem in protest of police brutality. Instead of working to understand what Colin was doing and what he was trying to say, a lot of people just kind of said, he's kneeling in the national anthem, he's disrespectful for our play, and I'm, I'm going to stay over here and vilify Colin and be completely ignorant about what's happening. Colin Kaepernick has not played in the NFL since January 3rd, 2016. Today, that's over 1,600 days. And police brutality is still, is still happening to this day. Nothing has changed, nothing has stopped. And black people still can't breathe. Um, to end this talk today, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to read this list. This is a non-comprehensive list of black people who have been killed by police since July of 2014. And it's despicable that this list is a non-comprehensive list. There's already so many names on there. I'm going to read these, these people's names. And then you're going to engage in eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence. Um, after that, I'm going to be stopping the stream and we'll be hopping back over to the Zoom for some, some post um, talk chat. 
And I, I really hope that you all join us there. So without further ado, Eric Garner, John Crawford III, Michael Brown, Zell Ford, Dante Parker, Michelle Cusseau, Raquan McDonald, George Mann, Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Jermaine Brisbane, Jermaine Reed, Matthew Ajibade, Frank Smart, Natasha McKenna, Tony Robinson, Anthony Hill, Maya Hall, Philip White, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, William Chapman II, Alexia Christian, Brendan Glenn, Victor Manuel Rosa, Jonathan Sanders, Freddie Blue, Joseph Mayer, Salvador Ellswood, Sandra Bland, Albert Joseph Davis, Darius Stewart, Billy Ray Davis, Samuel DeBose, Michael Sabby, Brian Keith Day, Christian Taylor, Troy Robinson, Asham Sparrow Manley, Felix Cooney, Keith Harrison McLeod, Junior Prosper, Lamontes Jones, Patterson Brown, Dominic Hutchinson, Anthony Ashford, Alonzo Smith, Tyree Crawford, India Kager, Levante Biggs, Michael Lee Marshall, Jamar Clark, Richard Perkins, Nathaniel Harris Pickett, Benny Lee Tigner, Miguel Espinal, Michael Knoll, Kevin Matthews, Betty Jones, Quintino Legreer, Antonio Legreer, sorry, Keith Childers Jr., Janet Wilson, Randy Nelson, Anthony Scott, Wendell Plestine, David Joseph, Callan Rockmore, Deshaun Perkins, Christopher Davis, Marco Lab, Peter Gaines, Tori Robinson, Darius Robinson, Kevin Hicks, Mary Trulio, Demarcus Seymour, Willie Tillman, Terrell Thomas, Slyvel Smith, Alton Sterling, Alondo Castile, Terrence Percher, Paul O'Neill, Altera Woods, Jordan Edwards, Aaron Bailey, Brunel Foster, Stephen Clark, Antoine Rose II, Botham Jr., Hamill Turner, Dominic Clayton, Atiana Jefferson, Christopher Whitfield, Christopher McCorby, Eric Reason, Michael Lorenzo Dean, Brianna Taylor, and George Floyd. May they all rest in peace and get justice for the actions that were committed against them. <laughs>